Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to another fabulous show of the Career Mastered Inside Career Success Show. I'm Dr. Lisa Wicker, and I'm so ecstatic that you're here with us today once again. We're excited, and we want to give a shout out to LinkedIn for this marvelous platform. And we're also excited because this show is something new, something fabulous, and we always are presenting high-profile women who are in the marketplace every day, supporting others, collaborating, lifting others up, women who win and women who give themselves to do the business of business each and every day. And so it's like all other days, we have a fabulous woman, remarkable woman with us today to talk about her career. And we're just gonna take an inside look of all of the wonderful things that she's doing in her career, her challenges, her triumphs, her inspirations. And I think this is what we do on each Thursday when we come to you with stories and conversations that are important about the content of our lives and our career. And so let me give you just a little bit of uh, background on Career Mastered Magazine, which is the host of this show. Uh, Career Mastered Magazine was founded in 2018, and we launched with parties in New York, Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, and Detroit. Since that time, we've actually grown globally, and we're ecstatic about the growth because we get to tell stories around the world. And that's not all. We are also featuring men on this show, men who support women, men who are allies, and help us get it done each and every day to advance women's leadership. And so let me share with you about our special guest today. She's a woman that uh, is... Uh, totally knowledgeable in STEM and so much more. And so that I get it correct, I'm going to read her bio, right? So let's give you some background on our guest, Dr. Tanya Matthews. The International African American Museum located in Charleston, South Carolina, has found the final piece of the massive global project that will change the landscape of African American history and its culture. Wow, that by itself is enough of an introduction, but I'm going to give you a little bit more before I bring her on. 17 months after breaking ground on the museum, its board of directors has selected as their CEO, Dr. Tanya Matthews. Dr. Matthews, an experienced executive thought leader and educator with a proven track record in institutionalized equity and inclusion frameworks, social entrepreneurship, and the intersectionality of formal and informal education is at the hem of this fabulous project and museum. Her background as both poet and engineer has made her a highly sought after visioning partner on boards across all ages and venues in communities that build projects as well as frequent public speaker that she is, right? Most recently, however, she served as uh, Associate Provost for the Inclusive Workforce Development and Director of STEM Innovation Learning and C Learning Center at Wayne State University. I could go on and on, but what I find intriguing is that one, she received the Career Master Award uh, as a, a leader, an act leadership in action honoree, but she also has worked with the likes of Nikki Giovanni. And uh, it says that she has also worked with Roy Ayers and the late Ray Charles. So there's history there. And I love to get into that. So let's bring on our special guest, Dr. Tanya Matthews. Hello. Hello, hello, how are you? Oh, I'm ecstatic that first of all, I'm wonderful, but I'm so glad that you could take away from your busy schedule to share with us this morning more about your wonderful career. But I'm just so glad to see your face since we've left each other and we both left Detroit, right? <laughs> Yes, yes, left Detroit. And then, you know, the past year or so has interfered with lunch plans. Oh, yeah. Least. <laughs> <laughs> I know it get together with that girl chat kind of thing. But uh -huh. I am so 
I guess I could just say proud number one, like I'm supposed to be like the one that's over here, like clapping my hands. And, and when I saw that you had taken on a new role and you were coming close to me, cause I'm over in North Carolina now mm -hmm. and you're now in South Carolina, we probably meet halfway. What do you think? I, I think so. I think we all can right. make this happen now. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, first of all, thanks for uh, sharing uh, a little bit about your career. As I mentioned in the introduction, we like uh, to be able to share with women that one, uh, are looking to move their careers forward. And then two, for those that uh, are younger generation that certainly need to see women that have been uh, not only proven, but are actually doing and compelling themselves to do the business of business every day. Yeah. So let me start with my first question. Sure. And it is you, first of all, have such a storied and very impressive career in leadership, along with an impressive career in education, you know? Mm -hmm. And so as I read about where you went to school and all the things you're doing, I understand that you received your PhD in biomedical engineering from John Hopkins University mm -hmm. and a BSE in biomedical and electrical engineering from Duke University. That's enough for all of us to just fall out. <laughs> But aside from that, you received an African-American certificate in um, uh, African-American studies. I just want to go a little bit about that background. Can you share with us, how did you discover uh, biomedical engineering and all the technicalities of your career? You know, the truth of the matter is, I think part of that answer is still accidentally, right? You know, I, I was definitely good at math and science, but that did not mean I had any interest in it, right? So when we talk about role models and representation and that kind of thing, you know, sometimes it just narrows down to, listen, kids like what they like and they like mostly what they see. Um, and so, you know, those kinds of things didn't strike me as something to study further or, or have a career. I wanted to save the world and, and make a difference. And I think ultimately uh, what happened is I finally uh, was in a program uh, that was literally designed to get young ladies to think differently about this math and science thing, to think about it as a tool rather than say math for math's sake or science for science sake, which sort of really resonates uh, in that way. So when I discovered, oh, you use this stuff for stuff. Um, and so I think that's what ultimately led me to biomedical engineering because I had been interested in medicine, but wanted a route um, other than, you know, being a doctor. But I think the other thing that I would say is that, um, you know, because of, of that time, you know, folks were, were trying to open those doors um, and using whatever incentives they could. So I didn't join that program because I'm like, hey, I'm good at math and science. I joined it because I got to stay on a college campus for a week as a 16 year old girl. That was yeah, that's sort awesome. of what got me in into that space. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I know as I have pivoted many times, uh, mastering your career does require that we have detours and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we might take an avenue that certainly wasn't expected, but somehow we managed to navigate that journey, right? right. And so when did you actually get a glimpse, um, Dr. Matthews, of your future career, that one that you're in today? Did you ever, I know you said it was accidental, but at some point, did you get a, a glimpse of this is what you will be doing today because you're the CEO of like the most important museum, as I can tell uh, right now in the on the globe. Hmm. Thank you for that. And um, I'll let you know when I figure this out. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, the truth of the matter is, I think that um, I am one of those classic examples of constant navigation. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it is only after I step into a role that I can look back and say, oh, Oh, okay, okay. This is why, you know, this has been useful. Um, even as I'm stepping into, you know, into this role, I got into museums because I wanted to think differently about education, right? As someone who was really good in school, I could love school and then lovingly criticize uh, yeah. sort of in that space, right? And so that's what got me into uh, museums. Uh, and then I understood the power of that and community impact. Then I understood we have some diversity and inclusion issues um, that really need to be attacked strategically. So then, you know, that's my journey to being a certified diversity professional and sort of being in that space. And then when you start to combine all of that, 
and, and you find me at the International African American Museum, no, the 16 year old girl who tried to just stay on a college campus to use her math and science did not see this coming. Wow. Um, but the slightly older woman- I certainly understand <laughs> that. And um, um, what I know for a fact is that your role and the roles that I've seen you uh, take on have been impactful. And um, it's it's a meaningful time to be in such a dynamic role that you have right now, having gone just through the George Floyd uh, um, situations and the whole racial, you know, unrest that we've kind of met, we're navigating through at this point. And so I want you to tell us in our audience about um, the International African American Museum. Mm -hmm of Charleston, um, how the board, you know, made the surge and, you know, the process that you might have gone through, because if it takes 17 months to find that person, that tells me that they were looking specifically for skill set that certainly that just didn't show up on day one from the first candidate. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's that's a testament to who you are. But I'd like mm -hmm. to know about the role and the importance of the African-American history and this project. Sure. So the International African-American Museum itself is a 20 year journey. Right mm -hmm. from from those concepts, those those early ideas to who can Charleston really take this on? Is this where we should be? To you know finding this amazing space and location, um, you know, so we're being built at one of the most prolific slave trading ports um, for this uh, entire country, and sort of working through all of that. Then of course raising the money, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so coming up to uh, to this point has itself been a journey, which means that the organization has always been on a journey, discovering who we are, uh, who we need to be. And so that, that means that building the museum, a board included, staff included, is not excluded from the learning journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I know we have uh, some women out there who themselves are sitting on boards or thinking about being on boards. You know, one of the interesting thing about being on a board is that, you know, you are um, a dedicated, committed volunteer. Right. Yeah. Um, and so and so your your learning curve sometimes to these things, you know, we also have to grow. And I think part of what was happening inside of that 17 months, this is an, an outsider looking in and bringing in my experience and other searches, is that you also need to take time to understand what you're looking for, uh, what's required, um, what's what's needed um, and trying to anticipate things that you don't. No, right? Most boards are made up of professionals that are not in the field of the organization that they serve. Right. Uh, and so this is where, you know, professional uh, search firms uh, come, come in handy. Um, and so ultimately the board um, chose a professional search firm, uh, Koya uh, Partners, that also had a process of helping the the search committee interrogate itself a little bit, get some yeah. feedback from staff, that whole, whole journey. Um, and so um, while you, as you noted, the full journey uh, was uh, 17 months, uh, quite a, a bit of time. Uh, my journey inside that process was about six to eight months. Okay. Right? So, mm -hmm. so when you're on the journey and sort of you're stepping up, it's about six to eight months. Um, and I have to uh, say, this is kind of a pro tip. Um, the best decisions I've ever made have been uh, when I'm happy, just right where I am. Yeah. You know, you spent time in Detroit. I still have a lot, a lot of love for Detroit. Mm -hmm. I was at an extraordinary uh, place of Wayne State University, yes. um, making moves and doing all these amazing things. And so I was sitting yeah. right where I assumed I needed to sit. Um, but various colleagues uh, from from the museum field um, had recommended uh, me into the search. Yes. Uh, and so when I got the call, uh, ladies, always take the call. You yes. don't have to say yes, I but love it. always take the call. I love that. Um, but, you know, with that call, um, you know, I, I, I openly admit um, the lore was was incredible. Um, as you've mm -hmm. mentioned, this, mm -hmm. this museum, this time, this this place, um, you know, and so so it, it went from from there once that opportunity was presented to me in that way. 
I love all your pro tips as you're continuing <laughs> to talk to me because we have uh, people watching and they mm -hmm. are with us. And so I thank you, Lindell, for hopping on and others that are here this morning that what Dr. Matthews has given us is as she's telling us her story, she's also given us advice and tips. Take the call, ladies, even if you decide that that's not the job that you want or part of your career, because you're exploring mm -hmm. all the time, right? All the it's time. time for us to always be open to exploration about what's possible. And so as a thought leader in institutionalized equity, of course, we should talk about the inclusion framework and social entrepreneurship. Uh, and what I gleaned from your background is that you bring the intersectionality together about, you know, your formal education, but also the informal. Tell us your thoughts, if you could, from a thought leader perspective on uh, what we've gone through in the last um three, four years as it relates to race relations. Now, I'm going to set the backdrop for that personally myself. I actually uh, was reared in the Mississippi Delta during the mm. 60s. And so I understand um, so vividly what that was like then. And then I understand today where we are. And uh, quite frankly, I have my opinions about how far we've come or how far we've gone backwards. Let me hear from mm. you about your perspective, if you will. Sure. I think it's it's a really interesting conversation and I'm glad it's still going on because I will tell you that that uh, as an African-American woman, uh, as a person of color, the longer the conversation goes on, the more honest we get yeah. uh, in shared company. And so a lot of this reminds me of those moments in the movies, right? When the, the, the main character finally goes to the wise person and the wise person says, I've been waiting for you, right? Like, <laughs> Oof, like the, the, this has been going on. Oh, you finally figured it out. And so yeah. I think that when we use words like awakening and reckoning um, and coming to terms with, I think it's important that we realize we're talking about um, our neighbors who had the privilege of not seeing these things, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the tension in the conversation. I think we need to be bold enough to be more exact in our language and all of my my uh, sisters out there who are in marketing, when you talk about market segmentation, yes, right? Yes. You know that certain members uh, of the community know this, certain know that. Yes. And I think that that one of the challenges around the the conversation is that if we don't deliberately acknowledge who was holding on to pieces of this story and these experiences before it came up, then when we come in the room and we believe we're all on the same page. That is when things get uh, dramatic. So mm -hmm. I, I would say that that's sort of the one thing, mm -hmm. um, you know, this flat out acknowledgement that this is not a new story. Mm -hmm. um, and now that I'm at a history museum, I can tell you this story is several centuries old. Uh, yes. And stories that you refuse to acknowledge will keep coming back in different ways. Um, what makes me the most um, hopeful and curious about this time actually is um, that folks are not as quiet about this as they used to be. I mean, you said, you know, you grew up in, in the Deep South. This wasn't about not knowing. This was about not telling yes. um, for, for many, many reasons, right? And, and what I have noticed is that that too has boiled up right? Um, that there's sort of this refusal to simply sit quietly by uh, mm -hmm. and that, that there could be something to that, right? Mm -hmm. there, there could be something to that. Um, but what I am cautious about and vigilant about is that for those who have just stepped into this space, regardless of what your background is, for those who have just stepped in this space, not understanding how hard this work is, mm -hmm. not understanding the fatigue will come, Right. You know, we like to tell stories about the Montgomery bus boycott as if it happened in the two hours that it took you to watch the PBS special. Right? Folks are trying to walk yeah, to work for yeah. more than a year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of that. And so for for folks who are who are new uh, in, in this journey, I am cautious and, and vigilant and attempting to be pre-encouraging um, because the fatigue will come, right? The frustration um, will come. And the status quo actually depends on that fatigue 
and frustration. It depends on folks running out of energy and deciding, you know what, it is just not uh, worth it. So I think I think those those are some of the things. Um, and then the last thing that I would say, and this is really interesting for me, I'm, I'm, I think I'm realizing where um, sort of my engineering background and sort of my diversity, equity and education backgrounds begin to collide. Um, is that this is a systems issue, mm -hmm. not a point by point, individual by individual, case by case issue. Mm -hmm. While we need to address and attack case by case, um, I think what I want to see more of is that we have a larger systematic conversation um, every time we have the the opportunity, um, you know, to uh, to to do these kinds of things. And I see us, you know, sort of. I, I wouldn't say going for the low hanging fruit because in mm -hmm. these conversations, there is no low hanging fruit, right? Oh, no. There's always really? four or five ladders and an army. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, not, I'm not saying definitely individual things yeah. and are somehow are not sure um, her mm -hmm. uh, internet is just going on. And I hope it doesn't continue because she is really giving us some <laughs> gems. There you go. I see you again. So All let's right. just cross our fingers that we can continue. There you go. Yes. Uh -huh. So I was just saying, you know, the, the, that last thing is systems versus tactics and that, that we both need to be attacking all of those at, at the same time to make right. some real progress here. Right. You've given us I mean, I, I can't wait to go back and, and revisit this this uh, interview, this conversation, because mm -hmm. there's some things to think about that you're saying um, that we uh, should come together. And at the end of the show, I'm going to talk about another conversation come up that's coming. It's going to be absolutely wonderful with three women. And we have to have these conversations because it's it's necessary to discuss and to and try to find solutions. As you're saying, it's 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 a system, systemic. There's some things that we have to connect the dots of the systemic issues that have been there and have not gone away. And as I say, I go back to the 60s. I, I vividly know what I I, I experienced, right? And so mm. while we're not experiencing drinking out of you know colored fountains, and we're not experiencing having the um, sit in a different place to see a same movie. It's mm. absolutely still those things, but just in a different way. And mm -hmm. so we have work to do. And what I want to talk about, though, is you personally. I'd like to know because I understand that you were born in Washington, D.C., and you're yes. the oldest of four <laughs> children to an, a teacher, which is an educator, and a cop, right? Mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. Why don't you take us back a little bit to your hometown and tell us about your community and family and what was life being like the oldest? Because I'm the youngest of, of five. And so it's a different perspective looking up. I want to know what it's like to be the oldest and how did your parents provide that foundation for your business acumen and your resourcefulness? Because you have that all. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. So, yeah, born a uh, born in Washington D.C. proper, which my mother makes me say, right? You, if you're from there, you know it's a thing to be born in D.C. proper. Yeah. Um, and then, as the family grew, we moved into the near suburbs of uh, Prince George's County, um, and uh, my immediate family is is spread across uh, that region uh, now. Uh, and I think you know, being the oldest of four is interesting um, because um, the sister nearest to me is only. Only 13 months behind. Okay. So I think it will be the, the one and only uh, for, for long. Um, and if you meet us now, you'll definitely see it. Oh, y'all must be sisters. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, all of all of those kinds of things. But but growing up, we had very interesting trajectories and relationships with things like the um, education system, things like the way we attuned into the world. And I think that really shaped my ability to understand um, that different people had different perspectives. You got the same background, you know, mm -hmm. and, and still come up to to these different perspectives. Um, and I think that having two parents who were both arguably in professions of service um, is probably also impacting me um, as, as well. Um, the women in my family seem to have gravitated to something left of center in education, uh, which my mother does indeed uh, take uh, take credit for. Uh, and the gentlemen are on sort of the legal side, right? So my uh, my dad was a DC police officer for more than twenty years. Wow. My brother is a public defender 
Uh, so in terms of that, and so, you know, part of part of that is a very interesting nuance to the conversation when we talk about some of these issues, such as what about police reform? What about police brutality? Yeah. Um, yeah. And when I tell you that my brother went into law as an homage to my father, Whoa. Right. And you have to understand the level of complexity that my family was willing to deal with. Right. Because yeah. you usually think about public defenders and police officers being on the wrong side. Right. Um, but they're both in that philosophy of, of protect and, and serve. And so, you know, when, when we think about that and, and when we want to have more complexity in that conversation, I can kind of lean into 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 that space. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. I want to say, you know, my family, I don't know how, it's probably my mother, because it's always, you know, the mothers, had a way of supporting the, the trailblazers in the family, right? So I was the first person in my family to go for a terminal degree, right? Yeah. Uh, and now I am one of, I don't know, four or five of us uh, yeah. at this point that, that have it. Um, you know, I've had those conversations of, wait for it. Don't you think you are educating yourself out of a husband? But those would come from a cousin or an uncle. Never, you oh never my from my parents, right? <laughs> sort of never at home. And it was it was kind of a shrugging of the shoulders in that, well, we prepared you and you're talented and we prepared you to use your talents. So if this is the direction that you're going in. Mind you, we expect you to do it well. Yeah. Um, but remember, you know, we love you because we love you. Yes. But still. <laughs> Yeah. Sort of those kinds of things. And so, you know, I um, that has been very interesting, I, I think, as I think through that, you know, um, you know, my, my family was not a strong proponent of you should be an engineer because you're good at math and science. No, those yeah. are messages that were, you know, coming coming at me. You should go into museums. I didn't even know people in museums had real jobs. OK, <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> it's, it's not just the a place to go for us. It's just, you know, you might just go visit. So it wasn't like a place that you would work. But I Isn't love it? what you, you've changed that to me in terms of perspective. Mm -hmm. And I would say, I think the bottom line for for me and, and what I believe that everyone needs, regardless of the format it comes in. So yeah, I'm going to do this in terms of my family and my parents, but they're all different kinds of versions of support systems. I understand that no matter what I do and how I do, I have people who will love me anyway I love and support me any way. Not because of it doesn't mean they're not going to hold me to standard, but having that um, in in my parents, um, having that in my my brother and my sisters, I think has allowed me to be brave um, yes. when I needed to be brave and to be bold. Um, when I needed to to be bold. So another pro tip, no matter what your foundation is, yeah. you find people like that. And so when you look at someone and you think you're so brave, I can guarantee you they're not brave because they're rolling solo. I guarantee yeah. you they're brave because they know who's going to love them anyway uh, at the end of the day. I love it. I love it. Because I, as I mentioned, you know, um, my oldest sister, uh, was the first in our family to get a terminal degree. So m with me being the youngest at the end of the of the uh, bookends, I just had no, I didn't have the choice. You know, it's just like, okay, it's a done deal. You know, from sorority to terminal degrees to all of that, I, they had already set the path for me. So mm -hmm. in your being the oldest, I'm sure you experienced some of that, that the, the, the ones that came behind certainly knew that you had set the bar. So it was quite frankly, no, no choice for us, but to do, the right things. And so what I'm intrigued about um, is the fact that you have this side of you that is a poet and um, it, it comes together in terms of who you are. So your background as a poet and an engineer is certainly um, why I think a lot of people, well, first of all, they love you as a person, but mm -hmm. the sought after factor that you, you, you have with your um, brand authority is certainly mm -hmm. as a result of that. So tell us about the poet, Dr. Matthew. <laughs> so, you know, the, the poet is, I, I think it's, it's really interesting, right? So it, it keeps me uh, more than human, right? Um, and uh, I think as a leader, you know, it's a 
skill set, right? Because now we're talking about being able to articulate, being able to inspire um, and have those kinds of conversations. And so I think that sometimes that does reveal itself in, in my language, uh, even when I'm talking about uh, technical things. Um, but I also think that poets, you know, have the power to heal, Mm. Right. Uh, and I have sometimes found myself in situations where I'm in organizations that are in need of healing. Wow. Right. Or in communities. I am now leading the International African-American Museum. And one of our end games is ending systematic racism on a global scale. Yes. That's going to require a little healing. That's yeah. require a little healing. Thanks. So. But I, would, I would also say that, um, you know, there I, I forget whose poem um, uh, or biography it talks about how they always come for the poets first, because poets and writers have this way of challenging um, that that gets through. Right. Um, and so there are some things that I can say um, as a poet and folks will, hmm, OK, that's interesting that you might not want to just put in a straight speech. <laughs> so <laughs> those kinds of things, right. Um, and so, you know, being called to to heal and challenge at the same time seemed like something that was very separate. Uh, mm -hmm. from my professional career um, up until I think recently. I, I mm -hmm. think the more you grow into who you're ultimately going to be, the more you realize that the pieces of you fit together like a puzzle, not a toolbox that you bring out for particular situations. And so I'm, I'm almost at a point where there's a constant flow of, of sort of both sides of the brain and, and the perspectives. Wow. And then this this talent brought you to work with Nikki Giovanni. My gosh, tell us more. I'm, I'm, I'm open ears about all of this. Tell us. Well, everything is a degree of separation, right? So my uh, initial publisher is a gentleman by the name of Kwame Alexander. Um, some of you may know if you all have young, uh, young readers in the house, he's become a very popular award winning poet in that tween and teen uh, age. Um, and he um, had worked with Nikki Giovanni. That was one of, of his mentors. And um, and uh, he had this thing about, you know, getting black poets out there and, and getting us, you know, off the stage and onto paper yeah. uh, and that kind of thing. And so that was sort of that initial uh, connection, mm -hmm. uh, just being in that space. Um, but being chosen for the anthology that she edited, um, I was not engaged uh, in that process. I just got the call one day. Wow. Uh, can we use your piece uh, in this in this book? And oh, I was amazing. I was in tears. I was like, "What? First of all, I'm being in a book that's yeah. an anthology. Second of all, it's edited by Nikki Giovanni. What? She actually likes my stuff. Yes, um, she is a she is a consummate teacher and educator. If nothing, if nothing else, so she's always encouraging. So oh, she kept wow. smiling at me with a bless your heart as a poet. <laughs> <laughs> Actually liking, I love uh, it. appreciating uh, the work, and so so that's how that that works. But it's a it's still a smaller than it needs to be network of yeah. um, African American poets and writers uh, and yeah. writers of color in general. And so that's in many ways how we connect. Interestingly enough, that's how I believe I got uh, the the um, capability and skill set to write. My mom was a poet, and, and uh, her her um, um, poetry was published by me. I wanted to make sure that she became an author before she passed away. Yes. And so when I think about the fact that I can just pick up a pen and pencil and I have no trouble writing, and then I know it comes as a result of having been around people that mm -hmm. articulate, people that uh, have diction, people that speak and know that you you don't just speak, you have to know how to write as well. Yeah. And so I, I consider you to be one of those persons. Now, uh, for people that are listening, um, it's 100 Best African-American Poems um, 2010 uh, is the name of that uh, uh, mm -hmm. Is it? And where can people find it? Well, you know, the last time I checked, it was, you know, still on Amazon um, and you can always order it through your local bookstore, you know, depending on how you want to uh, be in that space. Uh, yeah. And if all that fails, I think my mother still has 20 copies or so. <laughs> I understand totally. I don't, I won't even go there. We could talk forever about mothers, but uh, we hear stories all the time about people who try for years, uh, Dr. Matthews, to make it to the CEO level. And you've done that several times over. And so can you tell me simply, do you think it is a result of those who pay their dues that they get to that point or opportunity meets per preparation or 
or is it a combination of both? What If someone's listening and they say, gosh, I'd love one day just to be a CEO of a museum or CEO of a corporation, wh what would you say as a pro tip? So that is such a good question um, because I fought my rise to the C-suite. Um, I was not a fan of, of actually being at being at the top. I have seen the top and it is highly overrated um, and, and just everything really does flow sort of right to you. I, I prefer just right below, right? Yeah. Where you have a little more flexibility. Um, and so, so that said, um, the obvious thing is obviously mastering the space that you are in. I, I guarantee wherever you go next, you're going to need whatever it is that you're learning um, at that, that point. Um, the second thing I've discovered also in retrospect is that I had sponsors, right? Mm -hmm. Even for this position, there were other people that suggested that I get in that room when I didn't even know that room was open, right? And wow. so there, there are sponsors and a lot of folks we were doing these workshops, how to get your sponsor, how to train your sponsor. Please understand that some of our most um, powerful sponsors are the ones we don't even know are sponsoring us. They're watching us. They're Listen, seeing ladies. what we're doing and they have decided mm -mm, she needs to be in that room over there. And they're, they're making it happen. They don't give you any warning because they know you'll be ready when the call comes. So mm -hmm. That goes back to rule number one, always yes. be killing it two uh, sponsors. And then three, there is some interesting strategy, right? Which is, you know, there were committees uh, that I was sitting on or um, boards or things I was volunteering for professional development where I may be the lowest ranking, quote unquote, person in the room, you know, yeah. at, at that time. Right. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm in that circle. I'm in that space. One, I'm getting some warning about what that life is like. So I can yeah. do some feedback if I really do want it. But two, if you're in, in a good room um, or a room that's moving, folks are always looking for next and successor. And these are who they come to. Do you have any names? Do you have any things like that? And I would say, so as you climb, um, being, depend being dependable to the person that you are, say, accountable to, whoever your supervisor, your boss is, you know, C-suite, pre-C-suite, we get asked a lot of times to appear on this, to do, be on that board, to volunteer to support that. It's too much. Mm -hmm. So we're always looking for delegates mm -hmm. who can actually do it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that first road is that I became uh, one of the delegates, um, if not the primary delegate for my former CEO wow. uh, when it came to things about education and programming and plannings and boards and diversity. It's just like, I don't have time. Take that Dr. Matthews. Um, because, you know, he knew I was capable. He also knew he could trust me uh, sort of in those spaces to stay on message. And I, I will acknowledge he actually decided that I was going to become a CEO before oh, I did. Wow. Wow. Um, so, so, you know, I, I would say it's, it's, those, it's those kinds of, of things. And, and my pro tip would be don't be so focused on your next step that you're not mastering your current step. Yes. Because you need your current step to go to the next one, wherever it is. It doesn't mean keep your head down and don't even think about your future, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it, but it doesn't mean there's, there's a really important and critical balance there. Right. I, I totally agree. I mean, you have to, at, at, at the point that you're looking so hard at the next, you are not getting what you're doing today. So I totally agree. And so what would be your superpowers? I could tell you all of them, but I would like you to tell me because I I can absolutely tell you several off the top of my tongue. Oh, my goodness. So whenever I'm asked a question like this, um, you know, I, I, I like to to hope uh, that uh, one of my superpowers is authenticity. Right. I, I got a I got a real hard time. It, woo, not being real. Um, yes. but now, as a poet, you know, I can say things very smoothly, you know, yes. very nicely, you know, as an engineer, I can work things into the conversation that need to be. But I don't think um, that people see me as a different person when I'm walking into different rooms. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I do know how to, quote unquote, dress up for the occasion yes. that I'm stepping into. But but I think that there's a part of me that remains authentic uh, and radiate radiates out. And the second is, I do think a little differently. Yeah. I don't quite know how to, to explain it, but I'm always the one with the, well, have we thought about it like yeah. this? 
or yeah. that is great. And what if we did this? There's just something about the noodling. Um, and I do actually think a lot of that comes from the training as an engineer, but also the training as a researcher. Right. Both of those professions were taught to ask questions. Yes. And so when you combine that with like a creative streak or edge, um, you come you come left of center. Yes, yeah, <laughs> I love it that. though. I love your personality. And quite mm -hmm. honestly, I could go on and on with our conversation on uh, Dr. Matthews. You are a wealth of knowledge and I feel like we're just getting to the meat of it. I'm just going to have to come back and you'll have to be at our March event in, in Charlotte. So we'll talk about that oh, later. Absolutely. It's up the road um, now. We're, we're preparing for our uh, March 22nd, 23rd um, mm -hmm. Women's Leadership uh, Summit, and it's going to be held in Charlotte. But I, I need to have this conversation uh, a lot deeper than what we have today. But what I want to do is leave you with an opportunity to uh, have our audience uh, here, and you've already given us so many pro tips, but one parting word uh, for a, what we call the career mastered moment uh, that people can take and 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 uh, muse over or mull over about what they're going to do with that. Okay, so so here here would be uh, sort of my my advice, only partially tongue in cheek. All right, so it would be the struggle is real, but what has that got to do with your success? Oh, I love it. I'm just going to stop right there. That's it. I love it. The struggle is real, but what does that have to do with your success? Ladies and, and audience, I hope y'all hear that because I got a lot out of this conversation today. And I wish, as I said, we could, could last a little longer, but uh, we're going to say thank you for your time. We will keep our eye and our line of sight on the work that you're doing. And I plan to visit uh, the museum in uh, Charleston. I'm going to get on the road and come and see you. And uh, we'll get together in March. So thank you so much, Dr. Matthews. And uh, thank you, Dr. Wicker. This was wonderful. I love it. I love it. And for those that uh, have friends and, and audience and, and colleagues that want to see the show, it's evergreen. You should can catch it on YouTube. You can catch it on LinkedIn as well as Facebook. And so don't miss out. Go back and listen to all of this exactly um, uh, as she has given it to us. Many gems. Thank you this morning. And we'll see you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you that um, that conversation for me uh, added so much. It lifted me this morning. I can't begin to tell you, Tamara and Lindell and, and others that are on this, that if you have a chance to go back to listen to uh, what Dr. Matthews presented to us today, I got to tell you, uh, we can tell why she is leading and she's an international thought leader and a voice for not only uh, reason, but also for learning and moving forward in life. And so I'm going to share with you some other great news. I can't wait to, to let you know that uh, we have something good coming. I mentioned the Career Mastered Leadership Summit. It's coming on uh, March the 22nd, 23rd. And we are so excited that the nomination process is open right now. So you can go to careermaster.com to nominate a fabulous, a remarkable woman in the marketplace that is getting it done and making a way for other women. That's what we do. But also something that we do is collaborate with other women and support them. And as you heard this morning uh, from D Dr. Matthews, it really is about the conversation. And sometimes we just need to have that conversation and that talk with other sisters. And so I'm excited to share with you that um, another sister that I admire and enjoy, uh, uh, Joy D. Calloway, if you don't know her, she is the interim CEO of Planned Parenthood. Joy is out doing her thing. And I'm excited about the fact that she and Joy Reed and Stacey Abrams will be having a conversation on November the 9th. And I'm inviting you to join her. Let me have you hear from her quickly and then... And so I'm really excited about being able to talk about Black women's issues with Joy Reid, to hear from Stacey Abrams, just to kind of, as we as we say in the culture, key key a little bit, um, and just talk about what it means to be a Black woman in corporate America today, what it means to be a Black woman dealing with all the pressures that are on us in this country at this time in its life cycle, being a Black woman dealing with our health 
and our hair and our skin color and how we show up and our assertiveness and the way we love. I mean, I'm so excited. I don't know what to do. Wow. I'm excited as well. I don't know what to do. And so you should be there. Do not miss out on this opportunity to join the conversation. You should register today. You can register at events. That's events at ppgreaterny.org. And I'm going to spell it out for you. So it's events at ppgreaterny.org. Go there today. Register so that you can join this conversation. It's about our mind, bodies, and souls. This is the time that we should be having these conversations. We've just gone through so much with a couple of years of this pandemic. We have changed our lives, not only in our homes. Uh, there's just a lot going on from not only our mental states, but also our physical states because we've been uh, stationary. I want you to join that conversation. And as a bonus to that, I'm going to post that particular video and I'm going to uh, ask you to follow Career Mastered Magazine, the magazine that's hosting this show today. If you would follow us there, guess what? I am going to give you a free digital subscription to our magazine. So when I post it on Career Mastered Magazine here on LinkedIn, you will go there and follow us and then note in the comments that you followed because you heard it right here on Career Mastered Inside Career Success Show. And between now and the end of the day, all of those that follow us, you will get a, a complimentary subscription to the global advancement uh, magazine that we publish quarterly each, uh, each quarter, publish each quarter. So thank you very much. I'll, See you on November the 9th because I'll be in the audience listening to Joy Calloway, Joy Reed, and Stacey Abrams as they talk about mind, body, and soul. And to think that that was enough, let me tell you a little bit more. As a, um, an organization that certainly believes in the value of leadership and doing the right thing for our next generation, we are publishing a special commemorative um, magazine at the end of the year, first of the year, January timeframe on HBCU Queens. It's called I Am Her. And the I Am Her program really is about leadership development for queens. And these queens are exactly that, leaders. They have been chosen by their institutions to lead. And you'll be able to purchase that copy at the end of the year, the 1st of January. And we're ecstatic to have built relationships with at least a quarter of the uh, uh, HBCUs that we are providing complimentary leadership programs to them. And so I want you, to, if you're interested to volunteer to help us, just send a note to us if you're interested in, in uh, giving a webinar or speaking to these young ladies, do let us know. We will try and consider your engagement. And again, we're ecstatic about it. And last but not least, our last announcement, but certainly not the least, right here on Career Mastered, Inside Career Success Show, each Thursday, we talk to uh, remarkable women like Dr. Tanya Matthews. Us, along with that, part of our mission is to advance women's leadership. And because we have men allies, we include you too. We are absolutely glad to announce the Career Master Pitch Competition. It's our TEDx moment, if you will. So if you are unemployed, if you are underemployed, if you are looking for a new position or would like to shore up your leadership capabilities, we're giving you an opportunity right here on this show to do that. Our pitch competition will be held quarterly. We are looking for men and women that would like to take the opportunity to talk about your leadership. Why are you a leader and why would someone want you on their team? Now, I suggest that if I were in that space and I had the confidence and the boldness and the desire to master my career, this would be a chance to do that. So I welcome you to go to careermaster.com and sign up today to be a part of the pitch competition. It's in your hands, which is what Arvis Williams told us as a, a, a gem on her time here with us. And so we're come to our end of our show. We thank you for being with us today and we'll see you on next Thursday when we bring on, um, I believe it's um, Judy, 
Brunson from Cummings, and we will see you then.